enjoyed this whole series. I learned a lot and have a lot of ideas, which is fantastic. Also, I know I don't talk loud, so if you can't hear me, please let me know. Um, but yes, I'll be talking about fossils, a CV pipeline, a little bit of evolvability, and phenomics for most of the talk. Um, how do I make it turn? Sorry, sorry, I forgot you're on the Google, Google Slides. Now, whoop, now it works. <laughs> you can also use this. Cool. Okay, great. And a lot of what I'll be talking about uh, today is built on the theory, the ideas, and the tools of people that came before me, um, three of which are these folks here. Uh, Shetel, who's in the audience, Emanuela, and Arthur, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, but first, maybe a little primer on why do we care about evolvability? What is it? Um, so going back to basic bio, maybe people remember a shift in a trait mean that you might care about is due to the genetic variation that one has that's heritable and some selection pressure. And so if we had this imaginary ellipsoid with the red dot, that's the trait mean of two traits through time, we might ask how will this change over time? If it's just selection and the genetic variability doesn't carry, you might expect that you can just kind of push the trait along. Maybe the genetic variability kind of affects where it goes, so it might change it a little bit. Or often what happens, especially in like the fossil record, we don't know what the selection pressure is. And so we're curious about what's the amount of genetic variability that can determine where a trait might go. So how does that influence or predict trait evolution? And for that, you would look along the axis of the most variability and ask, where's the trait mean shifting? Is it shifting along this axis of high variability? And then um, you might also ask for this trait, um, the axis of the highest variability. I'm also showing orthogonal to it, the axis of least variability. There's a cone around the highest variability that is above average variability, which we call above average evolvability. So we want to know, can we predict, given this, this trait space that's going to be more than just two dimensions, can we predict the direction that traits are going to be changing? And a lot of this theory is based upon the gene matrix, so genetics, you know the parents, you know offsprings, so you can understand the genetic variability really well controlled. But for a lot of us, and especially those in the false record, we have the P matrix or the phenotypic matrix. And so we hope that G and P align to some extent, but we need to check and we need to make sure. And P is always bigger than G because it's the effect of the genetic variability plus the environmental variability, which I will mention again later. Um, and just as an aside, the way that we might measure phenotypes are things like landmarks, morphometrics, uh, linear measurements, areas, ratios, characters, those types of things that we've seen today. Um, and previous work has shown that maybe there is a way to estimate G for P or substitute your phenotypic matrix in lieu of having a genotypic matrix at large sample sizes. And 40 maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but for a population of mammals through time, that's a lot of things that we'd have. So we often look to invertebrates, uh, like that amazing forum uh, data set, which I'm not doing forums, but invertebrates are a great group to look at. And so some previous studies and what they've done to kind of show the history of how we came to decide that this is a project that should be done and we want to do, is people have looked at, is G, can G predict where evolution goes through time? And people have found that it can without knowing the selection pressure. People have asked, if I include fossil data, can I estimate G? And they can, which is very exciting. And then people have asked, if I only know P, how much does time averaging affect estimating P? So time averaging, you can imagine I have a chunk of rock. That chunk of rock might have uh, be a thousand years, hundreds of populations. You imagine if populations are shifting through that time, you're exploring some sort of space. And so how much greater is that phenotypic variation than the modern, and at least for other small invertebrates called diatoms, or no. Oh, what does he study? A uh, hunt. Anyways, these little guys. Um, it's like within 1%. Ostracods. Ostracods, thank you. I was like, oh my gosh, what are they? Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, it's like within 1%. So it's not that big of a difference of uh, phenotypic variation that you're getting when you pool data to the modern. What none of them have done is looked at how G changes through time through a fossil record. And so that's what I'm hoping to do with this data set. And so we're looking at a small invertebrate called Bryozoa. 
Um, they span, uh, the group that I'm looking at is um, Tegnaparella magnifica, which um, is a very simple bryozoan. They have one type of zoid, so some of these will have specialized zoids that look different, but we're just dealing with this one type. Um, it spans 2.3 million years through this locality in New Zealand, um, so that 0.06% of life is what we're looking at. Um, and what's really great about bryozoans is that they're clones, and so the genetic variation throughout a colony should be the same, and so we can actually tease apart the phenotypic matrix from the genetic matrix in a fossil lineage, which is amazing. So you can imagine that every colony is kind of like a, a big family, with every zoid being siblings. I also like to think of these as like little apartment complexes that they all kind of live in, and so we're going to look at every apartment complex within a big family. The issue though with fossils is that they don't always look nice. And so the image that I showed you is from a modern one before. Looks beautiful, look at that. Just, you can see all the bits of it. This is often what we're dealing with, or worse, where you have something called diagenesis, so the kind of how it's eroded over time. Maybe you can't see the outlines as well. They're dirty, they're broken. We're trying our best. And so this becomes a problem for machine learning because I think what we've heard a lot about is how backgrounds can get in the in the way or orientation can get in the way. We don't have an orientation problem really. We don't have a background problem. We have the specimen itself is a problem. And so how do we deal with that? Um, so the work that I did builds upon work by Arthur and Schettel, um, which Arthur kindly called the Steganator, which is what we're using, which is a pipeline of deep bryo, which he created, and ML morph. And, um, these are all in a shared Google Drive folder, and all of these links work if you want to see the, the GitHub repositories that they go to. Deep Bryo is specifically trained on bryozoans to segment out all these little apartment complexes, and then ML Morph automatically puts together or um, makes landmarks. They have really high precision or accuracy and recall and low misclassification, and some example of the time saving that it does. Deep Bryo, I think, takes about 1% of the time that a human would take to uh, put boxes around all of these little apartments. And ML Morph is a thousand fold quicker at putting down um, these 23 landmarks. The reason why we want to use something like this is to estimate the G matrix is super data intensive. And so for, I have hundreds of colonies, thousands of zoids, this would take me a very long time. I think it was estimated over 85 hours without that's before like data curation and all of that. Also as an aside, I have a paper in review from a previous uh, job that I had that discusses how we put together these tools into a workflow for longevity. So both for, um, I think we've heard a lot about how this becomes team science or these are really long projects that people are doing, you need to maintain them. So it's how do you make these open, fair workflows that not only your team can use, but hopefully can be maintained through time. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that too. <coughs> so here's an example of the outputs and the data that we get. We get 23 landmarks across these um, bryozoans. I spent a couple of days uh, checking that they're the correct, or Shelter checked that they're the correct species, and then I went through and made sure that all the landmarks looked like they were in the right spot. So I did some data cleanup too, which, um, and then extracted these 10 traits from the bryozoans. Um, after talking to Amy and Willa and another woman, Carol Ann, who assured me that these are traits that are meaningful. And so an example of the data that we have, like I said, I have over 5,000 zoids, hundreds of colonies. The original data set, I think, had 20,000 zoids that I trimmed down to the, these 5,000 that I thought were really good. Pretty good sample sizes. It obviously varies through time. Also, you can tell I'm a paleontologist. Time is down here. We're going through the rock to the top. And that's, so it's from oldest to newest that we're getting um, these numbers for. So very exciting. And just to give an idea of kind of what the morphological data looks like, again, time oldest here, coming to the youngest, all the way to your right, um, just the length of these apartment complexes. You can see that they aren't changing phenotypically too much, but you do get an increase in size and a decrease in variation, which we actually expect as you get closer into time. Can I mm -hmm. just super quick for a second? Are these all the same morpho species that, that you're mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, all the same, all the same thing. Oh, yeah, sorry, within lineage. So this is all within one lineage that we're, we're looking at. And we want to know how it's changing across its own time. Um, again, next step would be going across species. Um, so what we really want to know is how well can we predict the G matrix and how well does it correlate with the P matrix? Turns out pretty darn well. 
Uh, these are really high correlations, which is great because estimating the G matrix is not only data intensive, but it also takes a lot of time to run. And so it's nice to know that I can substitute P for G to some extent. The other thing we want to know is, does that G matrix change through time? So if you imagine that little ellipsoid I had with the major axis pointing to the direction that we would expect the most change to occur in, that ellipsoid is shifting through time. And so this is the amount that it's shifting. You can imagine it just like tilting on its angle through time. So that's the, so we're also finding that it changes, which is very exciting. Um, and so the big takeaways are that this is a lot quicker than doing it all myself. Thank you, Arthur, for annotating everything and making this pipeline for me. We can use them on possible SEMs, which is very exciting. And some of these SEMs, I can sh if people are very curious, you can see how poor quality they are, but yet you can still get information from, and that's very exciting. And I think it would take a lot to train someone, um, myself included, <laughs> to be able to like look at these uh, really diagenic um, fossils. And then also that we can generate enough data to be able to estimate G through time. Thanks.